Arthur K, everyone. All right. That was a lot of stories before we finally got to the sea serpents, but we couldn't leave those out. So I am now delighted to welcome to the stage yet another fellow of Odslan, Mr. Stuart Gripman, to talk about usurping serpents and how the Bishop of Greenland made sea serpents a thing. Well, hello. Well, hello. All right, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Stuart, I'm a fellow. Um, uh, as Anetta said early on, uh, you know, our, our speakers tend to be uh, experts and enthusiastic amateurs. Tonight I am solidly in the enthusiastic amateur column, my expertise being the very lucrative uh, cemetery photography. Um, yeah. <laughs> I am rolling in it. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I'm not an expert, but i got a great story for you. I think you're going to really like it. So let's get on with it, huh? Okay, we've all probably heard of UFOs, but maybe you haven't heard of a UMO, or an unidentified marine object, or possibly organism. Um, but for as long as humans have been looking out over bodies of water, they've been seeing some shit that they can't explain. And until you know, we had the printing press and methods of mass communication, um, those stories kind of tended to stay local, right? Your, your village, your people around you might know, few miles away they might know, but you know, that's, the word doesn't really get out uh, back, back in those old days. Until this guy came along. So, meet Hans Edgar. Yeah, rough and all, huh? Um, who, he was a uh, Danish-Norwegian minister in the Lutheran church, and he kind of broke the sea serpent thing wide open. Um, based on a sighting in Greenland. Now, he first went to Greenland in the 1720s. Um, he went looking for descendants of Norse people who hundreds of years prior had gone and tried to uh, you know, set up, uh, establish a place of, uh, of um, you know, living and, and working in Greenland, uh, and they'd lost contact with them. So now, come 1720, right, uh, Hans and his contemporaries in the church are thinking, you know, uh, if they're still out there, we had this like Protestant Reformation thing, and this could be really bad news for them because one, they could just not be going to church at all, or worse, they could still be Catholic. So we gotta round up a boat and get out there and save their asses. So he manages to do it, goes out there, and looks up and down Greenland and finds exactly none. So, as every good, um, evangelist will tell you, if you can't proselytize the one you love, <laughs> honey, proselytize the one you're with. So <clears throat> he went, uh, not wanting to, you know, go back in shame, he went and set up uh, a little establishment uh, at the site of what is now the capital of Greenland and started rounding up the Inuit and explaining to them why they're all going to hell unless they get on board with him. So, um, and, okay, it might be a little hard to see the visual aid there. I'm gonna zoom in on it. Um, this, <laughs> right? It's adorable. And this isn't, this isn't just Satan reaping a sinner's soul. This is remarkably what I look like every Monday night when I'm dancing at the goth club. Um, <laughs> You're laughing. That's not a joke. That's God's honest truth. Uh, so come on out. It's really fun. It's really welcoming. And the people watching. Oh, okay. Anyway, let's get back on topic, shall we? So by uh, inducing through probably, you know, threats, uh, scores of people, Inuit, to, into becoming Christians, that makes them super popular with the church, right? They really, you know, they like them a lot. Um, they're starting to name things after him. They're starting to give him, you know, titles and, and honors. And eventually, they bestow the honor of Bishop of Greenland. And between you and me, that's kind of like being the mayor of Buttonwillow. Um, <laughs> nothing against Buttonwillow or its mayors past and present, but it's just not a big deal. I don't think it's like monument material, but, uh, but that's what happened. He was super revered. Okay, but where do the, where do the sea monsters come in, okay? We gotta move ahead just a little bit. So, 
Thank you. Yes. Okay. Come 1741, uh, Hans's career is kind of, you know, winding down. He's sort of semi-retired. Uh, and he writes a book basically telling everything he knows or believes he knows about Greenland. And he calls it, I love this title, The New Perlustration of Greenland. Um, and it becomes famous not for most of what's in there, but it contains an account of a UMO. Um, so on July 6, 1734, off the west coast of Greenland, on a voyage that was going from Denmark to the settlement of Disco Bay, home of the Disco Ball, um, <laughs> a, a huge and furious unidentified marine organism was spotted. And I'm going to, uh, here's the most popular engraving of the day. Yeah, there are millions of versions of this. Uh, Science! Science. <laughs> Hold yourselves. <laughs> Let's just do this all night. I, just, just keep shouting. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna read you his account from his book. Uh, here we go. He, he says, uh, regarding other wonders and monsters of the sea, Tormador, in his history of Greenland and Iceland, writes about three different kinds, all of which are supposed to have been seen in the waters, but none of them have been seen by us, except a terribly big sea creature, which in 1734 was seen in the sea outside the colony at 64 degrees. It was so enormously big that its head reached the ship's main mast where the body came out of the water. And the body was as thick as the ship and three to four times as long. It had a long pointed nose, spouted like a whale, had big broad flippers, and the body seemed to be covered with a carapace and the skin wrinkled and rough. It was shaped at the rear like a serpent and when it went under the water, it lifted itself backwards, raised the tail up from the water, a ship's length away from the body, a huge, fearsome, writhing beast. But what the hell was it? So there's a number of things it could have been. It could have been a whale. It could have been a shark. I like to think that it was a Greenland shark that was kind of young and got away safely because it could still be alive right now. Um, and it may well have been a, a um, giant squid. And some folks theorize that it could have been a particularly excited whale who's rolling on the surface. Some of you are ahead of me with a large sort of tube shaped um, appendage flopping in the water. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> we'll never know. Sea <laughs> and, and how, friend. Um, we don't know. But it really doesn't matter. What they actually saw doesn't matter so much as the, as the legend that came uh, beyond it. Because this account became regarded as the first you know, credible account of an actual sea monster. Um, because he was you know, a, a, a bishop in the Lutheran church, highly respected, again, among, among his peers, um, he had a lot of credibility, even if he might have been full of shit. But what happened anyway is that when this got published and people started reading about it, we had a bit of a serpent boom. I'm not saying that before this, people hadn't claimed to have seen sea serpents, but here's what happens after. Just a few years later, uh, 1746 in Norway, a serpent that had sort of a fringy mane was apparently spotted. Here in the United States, in Massachusetts, this tough customer rolled up. God, I wish I was there, right? Look at that thing, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Okay, 1825 in Halifax, uh, a, an oarfish shows up and they're convinced it's a total monster. Um, it's actually, you know, it's a regular old fish. Uh, two more here. Uh, where are we at? 1877 now, um, a ship called the Maelstrom in the North Atlantic was attacked by a serpent that they claimed to be almost a thousand feet long. Yeah, fer ferocious. And the last one I'm going to share with you is um, 1879. Now, this is in Japan, near a place called Cape Satano. And the, the sailors report that a whale leapt out of the water, completely coming out of the water, with something attached to its side. And when it fell back into the water, that thing that was attached to its side was still waving around up, uh, up above the water line some sort of, uh, I don't know, vampire serpent? I don't know. It was, it was definitely a monster. Okay, and I've just shared five with you. There are scores of these, um, some, you know, less believable than others. 
Um, but it became like serpent, sea serpents became a really big thing. And when you think of sea monsters, you may, you know, go to serpents first. And I think it's partly at least because this is um, what this, his story wrought uh, over time. Okay. Now, usurp was in my title. Someone mentioned usurpation. And, um, well, let's first learn a little bit about the truth here. Um, Hans wasn't there. He wasn't on the ship. Now, I know he used the word we a lot in his account. <laughs> he was not there. Um, his son, Paul, wrote the account, <laughs> sent it to dad, and dad just transcribed it more or less word for word. Um, and the thing is, Paul might not have been on the boat either. We really don't know. It's, he, he might have, but there's, there's no proof of it. Um, okay, before I go on, I got, I got a, when I see this picture, two things come to my mind, and I just have to share them. One is, did the artist sketch the soul of the sitter? <laughs> and the other one is, what did this dude look like as a baby? He must have been like a really severe baby. Um, you know, I don't know. Okay. All right, let's get back on topic. Anyway, so... So his story is very tenuous. It's secondhand, maybe thirdhand. Maybe Paul just heard it, you know, at a, uh, at a campfire someday. We don't know. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter because um, the, the, the damage, so to speak, was done. And here's, here's what I mean by it. I'm going to read a quote from um, author Lars Thomas. He said, Strangely enough, although Paul and Hans interviewed the locals on many occasions about their customs and information about plants and animals, they apparently never thought to ask them about this strange creature. It might have given us valuable information. Far too often, researchers and others tend to forget that the indigenous people are the best possible source of information about local animals. And the thing is, they were too busy proselytizing, I think, to really, uh, and, and too too full of themselves to be humble enough to, to learn from these people who had been there for, for many generations. Because the, the Greenland Inuit, as well as uh, the old um, Scandinavian folks, have some really, really amazing um, stories in their folklore and, and uh, creatures in their folklore. So I've got time just to share three of them real quickly. Um, three of my favorites. This is um, Selkie. She is a shape-shifting seal person. When she's in the water, she's a seal. She can come onto land and change into the guise of a human female, and uh, the actual humans are none the wiser. Um, Sedna, a sea goddess who controls the ocean resources upon which the Inuit depend. So they're going to want to keep her happy. I don't know if uh, stand up, sit down for Jesus is going to do anything for Sedna. Um, okay, and my favorite, this gets a little cartoony, um, but this is a real creature. This is Kuala Pollock, also Inuit. Um, Kuala Pollock can, can, can manifest in several different forms, usually hangs out in the water, really likes to eat humans, particularly misbehaving children. So if you're getting a Krampus vibe, that's where it's coming from. So, uh, so, to, so to wrap it up here, um, you know, we always, do, we always do a little toast at the end, and I'm not going to toast the colonizers and the people who possibly lied, but let's, uh, let's, let's toast to Kuala Pollock, and uh, when we're out there swimming, please don't eat us. Thank you.